Mr. Speaker, as is evident from the bidding ceremony which took place today, the United Nations Development Program is a critical partner that continues to demonstrate commitment to provide support to governments to integrate the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, into national development plans and policies. This ceremony symbolizes the fact that parliamentarians have a responsibility to play a significant role in promoting and advocating the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and creating ownership of these goals. Mr. Speaker, those members who have not yet gotten a pin, I urge them to do so. I believe they are still in the lobby. Since uh, at this point, Mr. Speaker, allow me to recognize Mr. Bruno Puzat, UN Resident Coordinator and UNDP Resident Representative, who is in the gallery, and Dr. Elsie Lawrence Trunomi, UN Deputy Resident Representative, and other members of the UN country team who are in the gallery. Since the international community, including Jamaica, adopted the SDGs at the United Nations Sustainable Development Summit in September 2015, the UN agencies have been providing unwavering support to Jamaica's efforts. One notable manifestation was the support provided from the UNDP country office to facilitate the development of a roadmap for the effective implementation of the SDGs in Jamaica. We will recall that the Sustainable Development Goals were born at the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development in Rio de Janeiro in 2012. The objective was to produce a set of universal goals that meet the urgent environmental, political, and economic challenges facing our world. The SDGs replaced the Millennium Development Goals, which started, at, which started a global effort in 2000 to tackle the indignity of poverty. The MDGs established measurable, universally agreed objectives for tackling extreme poverty and hunger, preventing deadly diseases, and expanding primary education to all children among other development priorities. For 15 years, the MDGs drove progress in several important areas, reducing income poverty, providing much needed access to water and sanitation, driving down child mortality, and drastically improving maternal health. They also kick-started a global movement for free primary education inspiring countries to invest in their future generations. Most significantly, the MDGs made huge strides in combating HIV AIDS and other treatable diseases such as malaria and tuberculosis. The legacy and achievements of the MDGs provides us with valuable lessons and experience to begin work on the new goals. But for millions of people around the world, the job remains unfinished. We need to go the last mile on ending hunger, achieving full gender equality, improving health services, and getting every child into school beyond the primary. The SDGs are therefore an urgent call to shift the world onto a more sustainable path. All 17 goals interconnect making success in one, affecting success in another. The goals, Mr. Speaker, just to remind members, and I'm sure members are aware of them, goal number one, no poverty. Goal number two, zero hunger. Goal number three, good health and well-being. Goal number four, 
quality education. Goal number five, gender equality. Goal number six, clean water and sanitation. Goal number seven, affordable and clean energy. Goal number eight, decent work and economic growth. Job creation and economic growth. Goal number nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. Goal number 10, reduced inequalities. Goal number 11, sustainable cities and communities. Goal number 12, responsible consumption and production. Goal 13, climate action. Goal 14, life above water. Goal 15, life on land. Goal 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. Goal 17, partnerships for the goals. Dealing with the threat of climate change, Mr. Speaker, impacts how we manage our fragile natural resources. Achieving gender equality or better health helps eradicate poverty and fostering peace and inclusive societies will reduce inequalities and help economies to prosper. In short, this is the greatest chance we have as humanity to improve the lives of future generations. All these goals, Mr. Speaker, are interrelated. And as I read through them, I could easily identify areas in which the government has strategic emphasis. For example, which would be across the aisle when we talk about affordable and clean energy. I think we can say that the government of Jamaica has done quite a bit in ensuring that Jamaica is on its way to achieving affordable and clean energy. When we talk about climate action, I think all members here can say, yes, climate change is now integrated as part of our executive and management and legislative function, but we still need to do much more in protecting our environment and building resilience to deal with climate change issues. Obviously, Mr. Speaker, Different countries are at different stages, and therefore, we would have to incorporate and align the SDGs with our own national objectives and trajectory as we seek to build a sustainable, safer, and more prosperous nation. Jamaica is committed to achieving the 2030 Agenda and already has the mechanism in place to ensure effective implementation. A rapid integrated assessment of all Jamaica's national planning documents by the UNDP in 2016 confirmed that Vision 2030 Jamaica National Development Plan, the medium term econ socioeconomic policy framework, and sectoral policies and plans are all strongly aligned to the SDGs. With respect to monitoring and reporting, Jamaica is also very well positioned to monitor progress towards the SDGs, having completed a map of its data capacity in relation to the SDGs indicators. As part of its follow-up and review mechanism, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development encourages member states to conduct regular and inclusive reviews of progress at the national and sub-national levels which are country-led and country-driven. Next year, at the 2018 High-Level Political Forum, Jamaica will be presenting its voluntary national review, and in so doing, provide an update on the actions and measures taken to advance the implementation of the 2030 Agenda and SDGs. With the ethical imperative of the new development agenda articulated in the phrase, no one left behind, I wish to emphasize inclusiveness as the underlying principle, recognizing 
that we must secure our future by our actions today. I want to specially recognize the participation of students in this pinning ceremony as they play a pivotal role in leading the change. Their presence clearly symbolizes increasing awareness and interest in the global development agenda, which augurs well for the sustainability of Jamaica's efforts towards attaining the SDGs. Mr. Speaker, I could not stand here today without highlighting the alarming findings in the recently launched UNICEF report, A Familiar Face, Violence in the Lives of Our Children and Adolescents, which shows the frightening number of Jamaican children who die violently and who are regularly subjected to sexual violence and violent discipline in their homes, schools, and communities. The report noted that eight in 10 Jamaican children in the two to 14 years age group experience violence as a form of discipline. It also noted that 47 children were killed by violent means between January and October of this year, based on police statistics. This is already more than the number of children who were killed in 2016. While we highlight the importance of the SDGs today, we must reflect on their all-encompassing influence in making the world a better place for our children. Without changing the means by which we discipline our children and how we resolve conflicts. And on that note, I must reiterate the commitment that I gave in this house to ban corporal punishment in all government institutions. But but Mr. Speaker, as I said, without changing the way in which we discipline generally, we really could not be faithful to the SDGs. For example, if you were to look at goal three, which says good health and well-being. Mr. Speaker, I don't know how corporal punishment aligns with that goal of good health and well-being. I, I really don't know. And so while it is not a consensus across the aisle or even a consensus within the political parties about banning corporal punishment totally in the country, I wish to declare that I am totally against corporal punishment and that I believe that the time has come for the parliament to have a debate on this issue and finally declare corporal punishment at an end, both within public institutions and as a means of discipline available to parents. I think it would be a forward-leaning step in making a stance against violence generally, and it would send a powerful message about the state respecting the inviolability of the person, whether or not that person is a child or an adult. I think it would send a powerful signal, Mr. Speaker. All institutions and the homes. I think, I think that is where we really should go. Again, it is a matter that we would have to debate here, but I think the time has come. With such a report, with our commitments to the SDGs, I don't see how we can maintain this aspect of our culture and claim that we want to advance as a modern, civilized society. I, the two things are incoherent and inconsistent. Mr. Speaker, 
with support from the UNDP. Jamaica has embarked on several initiatives aimed at ensuring the effective implementation of the SDGs. And I'm confident that the strong partnership between Jamaica and the UNDP will continue and that we will achieve the sustainable development goals for the prosperity and progress of Jamaica. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Trip. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. The opposition joins with the government in saluting the partnership of the United Nations agencies with Jamaica in the attainment of our sustainable and millennial development goals. And I appreciate the frankness of the Prime Minister in his statement. What we agree on without reserve is that children, indeed no human person, is to be abused. And we advert that while it is of particular concern about children, because they are weaker and defenseless, the fact is that there is a great deal that we will have to clear up in this country regarding the abuse to all manner of human persons who are vulnerable and who are in a weak state. And we look forward and indeed encourage the debate on the particular aspect regarding co corporal punishment, which uh, the Prime Minister has indicated. Mr. Speaker, the Millennial Development Goals are usefully prompted by the United Nations agencies upon the Jamaican polity. But frankly, these are things that we should be doing ourselves. These are the common causes of all humanity. And they are rooted in philosophical and theological traditions of one sort or another regarding the sanctity of human life and the imperative of human development. In short, they are what we are all about. Everything else is detail and surplusage beyond the goals and the particular way that they are framed by the international community. Mr. Speaker, in order to accelerate our achievement of them, we are going to have to recalibrate the budget. Many of the pri priorities for expenditure, perhaps the most sacred exercise that this parliament ever does, is to determine what will be done by the patrimony of the Jamaican people, taken from poor and rich, but mostly from poor, proportionately, and used for, supposedly, the public wheel. And I ask this parliament today and commit ourselves on this side, and I'm sure all of us, to ensure that every priority, every line of expenditure is in fact in a direct way achieving some step forward towards these goals. And I believe that if we did that, the exercise that we carry out in March or April before whenever, every year, would have much more sharpness and point to it. The truth is that humanity in its history and we in our praxis very often are so accustomed to doing the same things over and over again that we forget the context of uplifting humanity, of advancing individual welfare and indeed moving Jamaica forward. The Millennium Development Goals, if followed by all of us and to the letter as far as as possible, would create a Jamaica that works for all, not just for some. And, sir, I contend and invite this parliament to consider that we have the resources, and it appears from the statement of the leader of government that we should have the will, indeed, to measure the achievement and to judge ourselves and evaluate the process that we engage in every Tuesday and whenever in terms of how we are moving the targets towards these goals. You know, Mr. Speaker, it's unfortunate because directly, it's very infrequently that this parliament considers the broad issues that are itemized 
in that list of, of Millennium Development Goals. Of course, every action is somehow intended in a very indirect way. But where you have limited resources and where you have a culture and an attention of people that is fractured by many diversions, it is significant when we stop, as we are doing today, with a simple gesture of pinning and with the statements that are being made here, to encourage a more focused attention on those goals. I noticed the uh, pregnant pause in the Prime Minister's statement when he recited the goal of quality education. And it is appropriate and commendable. And you know, Mr. Speaker, sometimes we're very hard on ourselves, you know. We're very, very good as a people, and we as legislators sometimes to point out all of the deficiencies of our land, and particularly the deficiencies of each other. To no point whatever, if those are not done purely with the desire of, of achieving new consensus and constructive criticism. We shouldn't be too hard on ourselves. We've done quite well in many of these goals, in achieving many of them. Jamaicans must be proud that through their investment and proper use of resources over the years, we now, unlike many other countries that perhaps have greater GDP than ourselves, have a place in school for every child, from early childhood right through to the end of high school and moving beyond that. The task is for equity and for quality, as the goals, in fact, call us to. And so, Mr. Speaker, in offering support, I say two things. One, that we, it behooves us to so structure our debate that, in fact, we are constantly bearing these MGDs in mind, not as impossible ideals that somebody else in the future uh, may, may achieve, not as platitudes that we trot out on occasions like this, but rather as real targets that describe our purpose and can define our successes and our failures. Mr. Speaker, the issues of violence to children have much to do with the inadequacies and failings of family life in Jamaica. And I draw the attention of Parliament to a, a resolution on the order paper inviting us to look at that fundamental, seminal aspect of life. If we really want to remove some of the stresses, the ignorance, the prejudices, the, the negative traditions that lead to violence of, 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 and abuse of children. And similarly, Mr. Mr. Speaker, with regard to the silent but pressing aspect of climate change, I invite you and I'm grateful for the understanding of the, and, and consent of the acting House leader that resolution number 27, which has to do with a vital aspect of climate change in Jamaica, the definition of the cockpit country will be taken next week. Mr. Speaker, it behooves us then to always bear in mind the issues that are raised here, to engage in not only debating so that the public can understand and ascribe to all aspects of them and see them incarnated and fleshed in the policies, in the expenditures of the state, but also that we should measure ourselves to see where we fall back and to, to celebrate and congratulate the successes and those who bring them about. Mr. Speaker, beneficence given to us by the United Nations agencies should never be taken for granted. It's a benefaction that we perhaps could not or have not afforded for ourselves. And what can we give in return, sir? By our faithful adherence, by our simple conformity with these goals, and by the measurement and consistent application of them, why then, Brand Jamaica, the epiphany of possibility for humanity that we incarnate and know of ourselves can in fact be realized. Today is a good day for Jamaica's goals. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker. Thank you, sir. Mr. Speaker, I rise to comment briefly on the presentation by the Honorable Prime Minister and indicate my full support for the things outlined, in particular as it relates to this House entering into a debate 
with a view to ending corporal punishments in our schools. Mr. Speaker, I make further mention of the Sustainable Development Goals 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. In particular, Mr. Speaker, Goal 1, as it states, no poverty, 2, zero hunger, 3, good health and well-being, 4, quality education, and 5, gender equality. Mr. Speaker, at some point, it becomes incumbent upon us and a nation to recognize that our laws, as it relates to women and children, do not, at the present moment, align squarely with gender equality, good health, and well-being. Mr. Speaker, if it is that we're to truly rid the nation of poverty and to rid the nation of hunger, then we must look at laws that would seek to enhance how we treat with our women and our children. Mr. Speaker, when we look at alleviating poverty, we can look at violence against women and the things that women have to subject themselves to. Mr. Speaker, we can look at the maternal, the maternal mortality rate. Mr. Speaker, we can look at business practices for women. Mr. Speaker, we can just look at women and children generally and how we position all rights, all laws, to ensure that women and children have more rights to govern themselves in this country. It's my contribution, Mr. Speaker. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I wish to thank the members who have participated, and I'm certain that the attention and endorsement given will be very encouraging to our UN partners. And I wish to just restate, reassure that Jamaica is committed and we are aligning our own 2030 vision to the 17 goals, and in particular those that are critical to our near-term development plans. Um, just in response to the member from Central Kingston who raised the climate action issue that the cockpit country boundary definition is, as we speak, being finalized. Yesterday at Cabinet, we had a special session where we went through and looked at the boundaries, and we are hoping that we will be able to bring to this parliament, not next sitting, but the following sitting, the final boundaries as settled by the Cabinet of Jamaica, and hopefully will be settled here in the parliament as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.